Okay, now you can start. <laughs> I think you need to introduce us a little Again. bit. Again, oh, I'm sleeping on the job here. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's one no. of those mornings. One of those mornings. Yes, it is. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the WellMed Charitable Foundation Caregiver Session entitled When Caregiving Ends with Lucy Barilak, MSW, and Elliot Montgomery Sklar, PhD, MS. And I'm going to tell you what all that stuff means and how smart they really are. Dr. Elliot Montgomery Sklar is a public health professional focused upon supporting the health of the public through academic work, research, and service. He has led healthy aging programs for seniors and for caregivers in Canada, Florida, and virtually. Dr. Sklar is an associate professor of healthcare sciences at Nova Southeastern University in Florida. He publishes and presents his work internationally, which is focused on the complexity of issues related to aging and caregiving. Lucy Berla has a master's degree in social work from McGill University. She is presently working as a consultant for a health network in Montreal, Canada. She's been involved in various research projects and has published numerous articles related to caregiving issues. She has uh, lectured at several universities and colleges on innovative approaches to caregiving and presents annually at international and national conferences. Lucy's also a consultant for private industry in the United States, including her work with the WellMed Charitable Foundation and their clinics in Texas. In addition, Lucy would like you to know that she was a caregiver for her mother for about 10 years. Okay, guys, now you can start. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, Minerva. For those of you who've just joined us, I want to welcome you um, to our session today. And as Evelyn was saying, uh, during the session, you have the opportunity to ask questions or make comments if your own experience. However, once the session finishes, uh, we will close the recording and Elliot and I will remain on the line for an extra half hour. If you have any additional questions, you can change your name so that you remain anonymous. So our topic today is really, a, it's a bit of a heavy duty topic. You know, we always say that caregiving is a journey and nothing stays the same. Caregiving demands a lot of time and attention and changes our normal routines and even the energy we have to be social and do the things we used to enjoy. In the journey of caregiving, which can be very rewarding, there is a finality, however, that all caregivers anticipate, the need to be thinking of, even early in the caregiving journey, because maintaining your sense of self is so critical to your coping along the way. Our focus for our time today isn't as much on grief as it is about how caregiving can change our routine, our interactions, and how we spend our time. So after caregiving ends, there are multiple voids or losses that a person can experience. We'd love to get your input and welcome you to share your own experience and questions as we go along. In many of our programs this year, we've heard from caregivers about how important it is to maintain a sense of self during the process of caregiving. This is also so important ahead of when caregiving ends. One of the greatest challenges among caregivers is a feeling of isolation in their caregiving role, which can be caused by a withdrawal from previous habits and lifestyles. While friends continue on their daily routine, some caregivers are left to feel alone in their caregiving duties. Uh, likewise, caregivers without support from other caregivers in similar situation may feel as though no one really understands their situation. This can lead to a withdrawal from social activities and relationships that they previously enjoyed However, some caregivers may also find that they are literally facing isolation. For instance, a spouse caring for their partner may be providing care on a 24-hour basis and feels unable to leave their loved one. Thus, their time for personal, you know, just to get back to yourself is reduced to nothing as they focus only on their care recipient. Sp spending time away from home um, only to go to doctor visits or to do some gro grocery shopping 
um, is really not enough. Spending time away from home only for that reason can really make you feel even more isolated. The lack of social interaction and stimulation from individuals other than your loved one, especially when, when cognitive impairment is present can be, um, it really can trigger a lot of loneliness. So while feeling alone in your struggle as a caregiver will have obvious emotional impacts, there can also be unexpected physical side effects caused by the onset of depression. Caregivers report weight gain due to emotional eating, increased blood pressure uh, that can, you know, caused by stress, both of which can contribute to complications such as diabetes, stroke, or even premature death. Although not all caregivers will experience such serious physical and emotional effects caused by isolation or loneliness, even the slightest feeling of being alone in your journey as a caregiver can have a significant impact on your overall well-being, you know, making you less able to focus on work, family, and responsibilities outside of your loved one. This is why we have hosted a series this year on health promotion tips for caregivers, which include nutrition, fitness, mental health, and social engagement. And you can still, if you haven't heard us, you can go back to that. And at the end, Minerva will tell you a little bit more of how to access these sessions. So I want to give you some tips. Let's look at 10 tips that are really worthwhile to look at in your journey. And I have to share with you that I as a caregiver when caring for my mother, this really resonates with me because I went through a lot of this myself. Uh, so prioritize self-care. Make um, sure um, that there's no negotiable part of your routine. Dedicate time each day for activities that relentless your physical, emotional, and mental well-being. This may include exercise, relaxation techniques, hobbies, or engaging with friends and loved ones. Set boundaries. That's a big one. You know, establish um, clear boundaries between your caregiving responsibilities and personal life. Learn to say no when necessary and delegate tasks to others, you know, who are supportive individuals. Setting boundaries ensures that you have time for yourself, um, you know, that, that will prevent burnout. Seek support, okay, if you think that you really need it. Reach out for support from family, friends, or support groups. Share experiences, concerns, and emotions with others who can offer understanding and encouragement. Having a strong support network can re remind you that you are not alone in this journey. Maintain social connections. We keep saying that over and over. Stay connected with friends and maintain social relationships outside of your caregiving role. Schedule regular outings or phone calls to engage in conversations unrelated to caregiving. That's an important one. Don't always talk about caregiving with people. I mean, the first thing they'll probably ask you and how are you doing and how is he or she or are they doing? Try and keep the conversation a little bit different. Nurturing social connections helps preserve a sense of self and prevents isolation. Preserve personal interests. This is important. Don't let go of your personal interests and hobbies. Crave out time to pursue activities that bring you joy and fulfillment. Engaging in your passions allows you to, make, uh, to maintain a sense of identity beyond caregiving. Practice self-compassion. This is a big one that a lot of caregivers don't even do. Be uh, gentle and kind to yourself. Acknowledge that caregiving is challenging and it's normal to have moments of frustration or exhaustion. Practice self-compassion uh, self by offering yourself understanding. Forgive yourself and self-care during difficult times. Don't be so hard on yourself, okay? Look at the positive aspects that you bring. And this one is, is important to set realistic expectations. Recognize your limitation and set them. 
for uh, yourself. Accept that you cannot do everything perfectly, that it's okay to ask for help. Adjust your expectations to avoid feeling of being overwhelmed or inadequate. Now celebrate small victories. That's another one. Acknowledge and celebrate the small achievements and positive moments in your caregiving journey. It could be as simple as a smile from your loved one or a successful managing a challenging task. For example, they don't wanna take a shower, but you got it done, okay? Recognize these victories, reinforce yourself, worth and boost morale. Take regular breaks. We talk a lot about respite. Um, you know, duties to just to recharge and rejuvenate. Whether it's a short walk, a visit to a coffee shop, or a day off, time away from caregiving, uh, you know, allows you to connect with yourself and prevent, hopefully prevents burnout. Explore personal growth. Now, that's one that caregivers that have been doing it for a while really feel that, wow, I've learned something in this. Use the caregiving experience as an opportunity to personally growth and self-discovery. Reflect on the lessons learned, your strengths gained, um, and the resilience you have developed. Consider pursuing education opportunities or exploring new interests that, that align with your personal growth goals. And, you know, many caregivers actually become, they, you know, they, they're part of a support group, a self-help group, and they feel that they have so much to offer from their own experience. Remember, taking care of yourself is not selfish, but necessary for providing the best care to your loved one. By implementing these steps, even if you do one at a time, you don't have to do them all at once, Caregivers can maintain their identity, preserve their self-worth, and navigate the caregiving journey with greater resilience and well-being. So when and if it comes to an end to your caregiving, you haven't lost yourself in that journey. So I know that I've said a lot, and I'd like to hear from you right now. So does anyone have any tips that, um, that you have that you would like to share besides the ones that I talked about? or any personal experience that you have. So let's hear from you. And we have Robert Day, who's already opened up his mic. Robert? Hey. Well, it's there's a lot to think about at this moment. I mean, I did say a lot and I want to, reflect again that even though I was in the field, I was working, a lot of this really, um, it's very it's very easy to lose yourself in the caregiving journey, very, very easy, um, and to feel very isolated. So I guess the point that I, and what Elliot and I want to bring today is that let's not do that, and how can we avoid that experience? So think about your questions. You'll have more opportunities a little bit later on. Okay. Uh, I want to, uh, again, also remind everyone that we always provide a copy of our uh, presentation slides. So if you've been trying to write down some of these tips, as we've been going, you don't need to. Uh, you can sit back, relax, and take in our time together. We will be sending out a copy of all these tips because really, Lucy, I appreciate you sharing them. They're great tips. Um, and I think that they're so important. You know, we say all the time how rewarding caregiving is. Um, but it certainly is work. It is emotional work and it is physical work. And at some point comes retirement from that work. And I think framing it in this way is a little bit uh, helpful because it injects a little bit of levity, you know? Um, and it also um, provides, I think, a, a lens for looking at this a little bit more practically. We plan for retirement from our careers, right? but we don't really think about retirement from our caregiving journey per se. And I think it's important to think about, you know, one thing that you brought up Lucy here, we're uh, maintaining personal interest. And I think that that's something that I've learned from other caregivers has been so helpful for them. Um, and certainly in our own experiences, um, one way to do that is to turn to things certainly that bring you joy, things that you might've always loved. Um, I have some colleagues that I work with who are caregivers 
And one of them had recently shared that she bought a pack of uh, canvases on Amazon, like a 10 pack, very, very inexpensive, um, and some really cheap paints. But it gives her something to do while her mom was sleeping or resting, something she always loved. And it was a very just easy and expensive way of, um, I think, almost art therapy in a sense. Um, another colleague of mine shared that audiobooks have helped her tremendously, but she found that she's just so tired for caring for her father um, that instead she, um, because she, she doesn't have the stamina to sit and read a book, she turned to audiobooks instead. And um, while she's taking a bath at night after her dad is sleeping, or if she has a few minutes to just lose herself in something. And I thought that that was, you know, another great idea because it's accessible. You can listen to an audiobook on your phone very easily. And these are things that you can have as constants, certainly during and after caregiving too. So many years ago, uh, I used to run a program for seniors and for caregivers. And in one of these programs, um, which was actually focused on um, learning computer skills for telehealth, okay. I had an older lady who attended these workshops every week without fail. Um, and she was really one of the people who came really every week. And as we got to know one another during that period of time, I had learned that her husband, for whom she was a caregiver for many years, had actually passed away months before she enrolled in our course. And um, she had just continued to live her life as a caregiver, participating in caregiver programs and such, because she really didn't know what else to do with her time. And she felt estranged from her former sense of self, uh, her friends after years of disconnection. And as I mentioned, she was a caregiver for her husband for, I think, close to 10 years as he battled Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. So when he died, all the things that she knew outside of caring for him at home was going to these caregiver groups. And what helped her to cope with her experience and her loss was to still be around other caregivers and to be a source of support for them as best as she could, as Lucy was saying. So some of us get a lot of fulfillment from helping others. And I think that in part, that it's for many reasons, um, how some people become caregivers more so than other people. Um, it's sort of a, a part of our being and it becomes that. And I think what she used to tell other caregivers um, was that to make sure that they continued to maintain a sense of themselves, just like a hobby or one close friend um, to help them temper the challenges of caregiving during and also after and to be a constant in your life when that loved one is no longer there to care for. Now, I think I was in my late 20s or maybe even my early 30s when I met this caregiver, but clearly she left a very indelible imprint um, on me. Uh, I'll never forget her and the lesson that she taught me and other caregivers. And I was curious um, if anyone participating today other than participating in a support group, if you can think of any other ways for caregivers to uh, reduce feelings of isolation. So please feel free to open up your line if you're on Zoom. You can just unmute yourself. You can go to the chat room, put your hand up. Or if you're on the phone, you can press star six and I can see that you have opened your phone line. And we would love to hear from you. It always enriches our programs uh, when we hear from our caregivers. And it looks like M. Holcomb has opened his, his, his mic. Would you please speak to us? Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, line. Excuse me. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, one of the things that I'm seeing, um, you tend to forget what you did prior to. And like some people say, and we'll reach out to your pastor or priest. And I think um, talking to others and also remembering some of the things in that way, you have the support of your priest and other church members to try to do things, to try to get the person that you're caregiving for to get involved in things that you used to do. Because sometimes you get so wrapped up in trying to keep them going and what you need to do for them. It is, it is definitely hard to remember about yourself. 
Yeah, that's a, an excellent point that you make. Yeah, a lot of characters do forget. You know, it's easy to forget, get into a routine. Yeah, thank you for that. You're and welcome. The other, and the other point that I want to thank you for uh, also including in our conversation today is that well-being has many aspects to it, and that also includes our spiritual well-being. And having um, support in your community from a spiritual sense uh, could be religious, it could be whatever helps to bring you fulfillment uh, and then give you that sense of community is so important. Um, and we, we hear that from other caregivers in their experience and in their journey too. And thank you for sharing that. So I wanna share, I wanna share, unless anyone else has uh, any other comments, sorry. I have a couple of tactics to share. Okay, do it. So one tactic that a lot of people don't really recognize as being helpful is to start small conversations with strangers. I know this might sound unnatural, <laughs> but it's amazing how such a simple thing as chatting with a grocery store checkout clerk can help to lift your spirits. And especially if that's um, one of your only outings, as Lucy was saying, you know, other than going to doctor's appointments. But if you offer someone a compliment, for example, like I like the color of your shirt, or you can talk about the weather. There's also, <coughs> sorry, uh, there's also a lot of evidence to support why some caregivers really benefit from going to exercise classes, even stretching or Tai Chi, because in addition to the physical benefit, there's an opportunity for some social interaction, which is so important. And there's a lot of research about the benefit of these interactions to help counter isolation and loneliness, even if it is just a small chat about the weather. Um, I think one of the things, if you've ever shopped at Trader Joe's grocery store, um, one of their hallmarks is that their checkout clerks will always make a comment to you about something in your purchase. Um, when I was growing up, I used to work at The Gap through college, and we were always taught that you should always acknowledge what someone is purchasing. Let them know that you really like it or the color looks good on them. It's simply a way of making people feel actually more comfortable and engaged, and then they're more likely to shop at that store. So the same holds true, actually, when it comes to our interactions, even if they are just very, very um, superficial. Uh, it can really help, actually, to improve people's mood in a way that you might not recognize. So I think it's also important to think about how much time you actually spend providing care, because for a lot of people, that is a significant amount of time. Now, what would you be doing with that time otherwise? That's a very hard question for a lot of people. And it's important to start thinking about those things. Um, could you start incorporating some things into your life at the present? Like taking, as I said, a, a, a stretching class once a week. Um, some people find that that's really helpful. So that's part of why I'm also such a proponent of exercise uh, because it does help to boost our uh, brain chemicals, our mood. It's something you can actually do from anywhere, uh, especially since COVID. There are free um, exercise videos and benefits to physical health that are well known. Um, as Lucy mentioned, we had hosted a series this year called Our Health is Our Wealth. And in today's resources, I actually have included a link to those recorded presentations um, from the WellMed Charitable Foundation website, because some of those benefits can really be helpful. And it's critical exercise, I think, for our mental health and also really helpful for processing grief and also for healing. So I did want to talk a little bit about something called anticipatory or preparatory grief, um, which is a feeling of sadness ahead of knowing that someone is going to pass or decline and that grief is going to follow. And it really is just like grieving before the person has passed. It can also happen with a pet or with relationships in our lives that we know are finite or limited in time. And in reality, all of our time is finite and limited, but it's not a very optimistic viewpoint to take. So as more illnesses are becoming managed as chronic disease and medications, for example, for advanced cancers are allowing people to live longer, 
we're hearing more about anticipatory grief because people are living longer with chronic or terminal illnesses. And anticipatory grief also referred to uh, distress that people might feel in the days, months, or even years before the passing of a loved one. And it's very common among caregivers too of people with late stage degenerative diseases like Parkinson's, MS, and Alzheimer's. And again, those cancers I mentioned. What's been very interesting too is that um, in research and also in clinical uh, experience, the younger a, a caregiver is, the more likely they are to experience severe anticipatory grief as it relates to death. In a review of 15 studies exploring anticipatory grief and illness, doctors at the University of uh, Illinois at Chicago found that younger caregivers and also younger patients tended to report higher feelings of anticipatory grief. And one of the thinkings behind that is that younger people tend to be more forward thinking, um, whereas opposed to older people are more likely to think sometimes about things that have happened to them previously. And so that difference in perspective can really change a person's journey as it relates to uh, caring and, and also life after caregiving. So there's uh, a very interesting difference here um, among the experience of younger versus older caregivers. And uh, I wanted to share some of the symptoms of what anticipatory grief actually looks like um, so that you might recognize that that's something that you might be feeling at times. That can include anger or irritability, anxiety, perhaps denial about a person's decline, the desire to withdraw from social situations, feeling at times desperation or dread, guilt, um, an intense preoccupation with that person's passing, loneliness, uh, loss of control over your emotions, emotional dysregulation, uh, feeling very fearful as an example. Um, in short, really, I think anticipatory grief feels and looks a lot like grief. And in fact, if we know a person's time is imminent, grief can actually often begin ahead of a person's passing. So if you're experiencing anticipatory grief, it's really important to speak with someone. Um, as we've heard, that can be someone like your pastor, that can be uh, a grief counselor, um, that can also be a therapist. There are a lot of common counseling interventions to help with grief in helping a person reframe loss, um, better appreciate the time that they do have with that person, trying to find a good moment in every day. Um, it can be very helpful also for people to even begin to write a memorial for someone, even if they're still living. And the reason for that is that it forces you to think about the impression that person has made upon your life and the good moments that you've had together. This can sometimes be something that can help shift your focus into something more positive and also constructive. And I was just curious to hear from our participants today what your thoughts, what your feelings, what your experiences related to this might be. This is your opportunity. Robert Day, did you open your phone again? Would you like to talk to us? <laughs> Can I say something really quick? Of course. Um, the thing of it is, is I want to say a lot of times it's the perception of others, of the person you're caregiving. They might say, oh, look, they've got this disease. They are, look at their age. That's why they're not healing after the surgery. And I think when others come into the home while I'm caregiving and say things like that, that's what, I'm not saying that I'm not. Uh, aware and being naive of the situation I know, but a lot of times others put negative thoughts in my brain. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I mean, that's really a, a very important point. Yeah, it's many times people around us make a lot of judgments and that could be very painful. Um, you know, the whole idea of uh, anticipatory grief is, is something kind of new in a sense, because we're kind of taught not to really think about it. We want to look at, you know, the present, stay in the moment. But I think there's a lot of value in that as well, to be able to sort of think about it and 
and and and look and see what will it look like it it allows us to helps us to um to take care of ourselves but your point is so well taken and and how do you deal with that how do you not take this these comments of other people personally and so it goes back to what i was saying and what elliot is saying is know your worth okay know your strength you know who you are so even if somebody does make a, a comment, um, try not to take it personally. Not always easy, but that's why we keep reinforcing that you who you are is so important to be able to set limits and not allow distraction into your life that makes you feel even more alone and, and lonely. And, and I want to add your comment resonates with my head and my heart. I feel exactly what you're saying. And it makes it hard in two ways, because then I think it makes us more inclined to want to withdraw from those people um, because their comments might not be helpful to us. Um, but I think second to that, it's incumbent upon us to take a step back and recognize that these comments are meant not to hurt us, but to be helpful, um, to help give us perspective in case people think we don't have it. Um, but at the end of the day, you're the one providing the care. You're the one spending the most amount of time with that person. And obviously, you're also getting something back from that relationship. And that's not always easy for other people to understand. Anybody else have a comment? We'd love to hear from you. Question? Your experience? Good. Okay, so let me share an email we received from uh, a caregiver. We like to include those because we do receive them a lot. And so here is one. I've been a caregiver for my husband for, oh, for the past four years. Mike has many physical problems, but the major one is, the, is dementia. I'm totally absorbed with his daily care, home management, and his doctor's appointment. His condition is slowly deteriorating and I'm totally lost. I always felt that I was in control, but I don't, I do not think that way any longer. I realize that I have been neglecting myself and I'm scared. I have good family and good friends, but I don't have the time and energy to socialize with them. My yes. whole life is wrapped around my caregiving. My uh, biggest concern is what will I do if I can no longer care for Mike uh, or if he passes away? I feel so lost well i hope you're on the line and if you are thank you for your email i'm so sorry that you're going through this difficult time but i do feel that the fact that you recognize that you are neglecting yourself and that you're scared about the future is the first step to getting help and you are and recognizing that you are not, not alone in these particular circumstances so it's so important to educate yourself around grief um, and loss and about all the things that we've been talking today as a way for you to maintain and get the help and support that you need. I do want to share that the Family Caregiver Alliance has some great resources on grief and loss, but also on moving on. Okay, so let's look at, at that a little bit. According to, to them, the most common feeling and needs for following, following caregiving include, obviously, there is grief. Uh, it's normal to feel sad, to feel angry, to feel hopeless, um, devastated. Our society says that you should get over it in, in a week or two. Okay, actually, it often takes one to two years allow yourself these feelings, they are normal and appropriate. And for some people, it takes even longer. Nobody should push you into that. But keep in mind that if your grief is so that you find yourself being depressed, you do need to go and get help. Now, many times caregivers feel relief. Many caregivers feel that their ordeal is over and that the care receiver is no longer suffering. This is not something to feel guilty about. It's one of the many feelings that people have when caregiving ends. Grieving may have started many years before with a gradual letting uh, go process, 
particularly with people with dementia, because with dementia, you kind of, the person is there, but you've kind of lost who they are. I remember feeling that very much with my own mother. It's important to also forgive yourself. Caregivers often feel guilty about every time they were not the perfect caregiver. There's no such thing. Everyone was, uh, it, you know, people are, can be impatient, angry, frustrated, unkind at some point during their time as a caregiver. Maybe you yelled it or screamed a little bit too loud. It's okay. Don't, you know, don't second guess yourself for what ifs. You're probably couldn't have done anything else, even though you are thinking you could have. Celebrate how well you did the job. We keep talking about that. Now, one of the things that caregivers go through is lack of sleep, okay? Often one of the first things, um, you know, caregivers feel exhausted. Now is the time to sleep. You need to renew uh, your energy. Sometimes you need to stay in bed for a day and cry or just pull the covers over your head and watch TV. You deserve to take a break. You might uh, enjoy the quiet, the doing nothing. Uh, I believe in that. I believe in giving yourself time to just wallow in your sorrow. But keep in mind that it should be limited. And if it continues too long, it's time to get a little bit of help. Confusion caregivers have put their lives on hold in order to be a caregiver. Now you're out of the job that you held for the past several years, and you might have to redefine your purpose. It's normal to feel adrift as you try to find your place in the world that, uh, and figure out who you are now. That's a big one. So let's look at redefining, okay? Time. What to do with it? And Elliot was speaking about time. Time was structured for you while you were caregiving. Now you have to figure out what to do each day. You learn good time management skills while you were a caregiver. Use these skills now for you to achieve new goals. Celebrate having time to reflect and make new decisions. Thinking about the future can be scary. Take one day at a time. Let's talk about loneliness. There can be an emptiness, a void that comes from not being needed in the same way anymore. Since caregiving is so all-consuming, caregivers often end up isolated. You know, so when caregiving ends, you often have to rebuild a social network, make social engagement when you feel you want to, but allow others who invite you to do things um, to, to actually say yes, don't always say no. Push yourself a little bit, go out of your comfort zone. Now activities, take small steps and entering into life again, identify activities that you enjoyed. As one of our participants said, remember what you used to enjoy in the past. Take care of you, exercise, get in that sleep and eat right. I know we constantly talk about it, but it works. The three things we all have to do, but now you can. You had to be strong for someone else. Now you can be strong for you. But you can also now let go and express your vulnerability. You have the right to the full range of emotions. Now you can feel them. Caregiving, financial situation often changes when uh, caregiving ends. Make sure to pay attention to finances, whether your situation is better or worse than before. Get help if you need it. Seek counseling if you need support or just talk through all that you have been through and continue to, uh, to go through it. Embrace your new life. Appreciate the skills that you've learned. Learn from your experience and, you know, make your own home yours again. I was wondering if anyone had any uh, other tips or suggestions that they wanted to add to this list here. Well, Andre does. Well, she has a question. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> you... see. I do see that question. How do you suggest we tackle a situation when a family member takes full responsibility for the care of their mother, is fully involved, considers herself the best and only person competent enough to be a caregiver, resists attempts uh, by her family to assist and share the workload to a point of tense and aggressive exchanges? It's a great question. 
That's a huge question. We could spend a lot of time around that one. Well, obviously this person really feels they need to be in control of everything. And they really uh, don't even allow themselves to give themselves the opportunity to let anybody um, help or support. So I think it's important to recognize where the person is at. And instead of challenging them to maybe go around in a different way by acknowledging to them how much you appreciate everything that they do and um, that you do care about them and you're concerned um, about their well-being and that to let them know that you're there for them uh, if and when they, they feel that they could uh, have some help and support from you. So many times, as long as there's no risk factors involved, it's just being able to let that person know that you're there. Um, again, acknowledge that you appreciate what they're doing. And sometimes you just have to kind of let it go for the time being and just let them know that you're, you know, that you are there regardless and not be uh, too judgmental. That's a great answer. I will add also, if things continue to devolve, you may want to consider including a social worker or a family therapist to help with a, a mediation or almost an intervention. Um, obviously, this caregiver is getting something from their role as a caregiver for this person. And so I think one way of, as Lucy was suggesting, of working in a different way is um, trying to understand what that is, and then perhaps to suggest that perhaps some respite may be of benefit to the care recipient, to the mother, as opposed to suggesting that that person share a workload um, to view it as something that would be beneficial to the care recipient. So there are different strategies, and that's really what um, family counselors are equipped to help with, certainly. And if you question. want, Thank you, Ellie. And if you want to stay a little bit after we finish, we can go into it a little deeper so we have a better understanding of what the dynamics are. Yeah. And, um, you know, if anyone has any other tips or questions, I want to certainly invite that. You see, Andres? Andre, you were on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> Because you've been a participant in so many of our programs, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I am sure that you know you're doing everything that you can to be supportive and helpful, and um, and you, I'm sure that you are doing everything the right way, whatever that means in your situation. Two of the tips, Lucy, that you uh, mentioned here really caught my attention. Oh, we we have a comment. Um, I think that control is hard to let go of. It will take some time for someone that cannot easily let go. We'll see. Just be ready for that to happen. And I think that that's a, a great comment. Um, that's why I was saying, obviously, that person is getting something out of mm -hmm. their, uh, their behavior. So it's important always to think about the fact that we as people do be, we engage in behavior that benefits us in some way. If we didn't get something out of doing something, we wouldn't keep doing it. So um, two things that really caught my attention um, from these, these tips and, and some of the things that you were sharing here were the issue of loneliness and also of making your home your own again. You know, many people don't consider their care recipient um, as a source of company, but in fact, they often are, and you're usually with that person or seeing them regularly. So it would be very normal for caregivers to feel two losses, um, a loss of the care recipient and a loss in terms of feeling lonely. Um, again, that's why it's so important to keep active and to keep social as much as possible during your caregiving journey as much as you can. And I believe that too, because grief is really not a linear process. Um, there's no beginning, there's no end, and sometimes there may be triggers like birthdays or anniversaries or holidays. So I think it's important to build coping skills just as we build caregiving skills. And I think people find that that comes in handy. And speaking of handy, no pun intended, but you had brought up the issue of making your home your own again. And sometimes, you know, caregiving requires home modifications and adjustments to take care of a loved one. 
Uh, Lucy and I talk a lot about that, about putting, you know, grab bars in the showers and things like that. But we don't talk about undoing those things and what happens after caregiving ends and how important it can be for a person's mental health to make their home environment healthier. And that might mean cleaning out your closet or removing um, those grab bars, perhaps. Um, these are just things to think of. Um, additionally, um, you know, I was talking about that person who painted all those canvases. You know, think of things that you can do to perhaps redecorate. It might mean putting up some new photos or artwork. Um, for other people, it might be repainting. Um, but just remember, too, that counseling, I think, provides uh, really a dedicated space for your feelings that's really, really important if you need it. And uh, we have always reminded people again, but many health plans also now cover mental health counseling using telephone or telehealth with video. Um, there was just news yesterday of some potential new legislation that uh, mental health be included in our general health insurance as well. So uh, I'm glad to see that there's an expanded attention to how important mental health is. And there's actually a lot of research that supports how beneficial telehealth and phone-based uh, support can be. Uh, a 2021 study, in fact, of telehealth interventions for family caregivers had found that telehealth was a very effective tool in delivering caregiver interventions, which led actually to caregiver improvement in outcomes. Um, and that was with things like health and well being. So, just like with all healthcare, um, there are still inequities. Uh, we know that caregivers from minority groups, for example, were less likely to participate in online programs. Uh, people in rural areas may not have. Um, high-speed internet to connect necessarily. So we are doing more uh, outreach um, and certainly we invite our participants to help spread the word about the programs offered here by the WellMed Charitable Foundation. Um, yes, we've evolved to Zoom. However, you can always still join by phone. It's so important for many caregivers who, um, who just want that support. Um, and I wanna thank you all for participating today. Um, because I think not only is the care that you provide so critical, um, the support and the tips that you share with us and with one another are so helpful. So I'm going to invite Lucy to make some closing remarks and then share resources with you. Well, I have to say that what, making your, your home your own just reminded me uh, of a caregiver that I was counseling and had a really, really difficult time. And when we kind of focused a little bit more about like, okay, yes, um, you were grieving and, and it was hard to move forward. So I just asked her if you had one thing to do just to make you feel um, that you sort of, you know, your house is your home and that you're comfortable in. I was shocked when she told me, well, the one thing that I would really want to do is change my bed cover. And I kind of looked at her. I said, really? She said, yeah, um, because it just so reminds me that um, my husband is no longer here. So I said, so why don't you do it if, you know, if you're able to afford to do that? And so it was just one little thing. And then the next session that she came back to, she had a smile on her face. I said, so you, you did it, didn't you? She says, yes, I did. And I said, so what was it? What, did, what color was it? I, she said, it was totally different. It was so floral and it was so feminine. Whereas before I had to negotiate with him. And it's kind of makes me feel so much better when I walk into my room. I haven't forgotten him, believe you me but it just lifted my spirit. So it doesn't have to be major things in your life, but if you're honest enough with yourself and not feel guilty, give yourself that opportunity. How do I, how do I make that my own? And so I just, it just popped into my head, which I thought was so, um, it was just such just the right time to share it with you. Yes, Ellie. I mean, we said an awful lot. There's a lot to take in. Some of it uh, is hard to even process. Like, how do you move forward when you lose someone that you've cared for for years and years? Easier said than done. But there are ways. And the most important is um, 
you know, to, to know that you're not alone in this. And I want you to, you know, I, I thank you for joining us. And I hope for some of you, you will stay on a little longer. Remember how it's important it is to take care of yourself, especially your mental and physical well-being, okay? Um, sometimes we don't even recognize and think of what it is that we're going through. Uh, and as I said before, uh, I give myself permission a day and a half to wallow in my sorrow. But remember, I don't let it go any further. <clears throat> if it does, you really, really need to be conscious of that because your mental well-being will have an effect on your physical well, your well-being for sure. And remember that life is a balance. And so is caregiving. Uh, in the caregiving journey, while you're still going through it, there are two people who need to be cared for. So please don't forget to care for you as well. And if you're dealing with uh, loss and grief, um, um, give yourself the time to go through it. And as Elliot said, there are resources. Should we sell some of those resources? Those resources are up. Um, I have the link up here. If you see something underlined in blue, it is a hyperlink. So you can click on it and access the link um, in our slides, in our handouts that you'll be receiving. We did include here the link to Our Health is Our Wealth, our recorded series on the Woman Charitable Foundation website. But we also have the fact sheet on grief and loss here from the Family Caregiver Alliance. And also, um, you can always call 988. That is the hotline now to access free mental health. I did want to quickly just read a chat from Sharon. Thank you for the session. I've done a lot of reading and attended workshops on caregiving. The session was great because it's the after that I have not paid attention to. I cared for my mom for 12 years, and it's truly a process moving forward. I have a support group as well as a spiritual group. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, we have one more comment here from Andre. Uh, I cannot really stay longer. I am still working full-time as an OT. I have to get back to work. But once again, your presentation was just perfect, concrete, realistic, applicable. It's always a pleasure um, to attend. I keep relaying my uh, your coordinates to my colleagues for our patients and their families. Thank you so much, Andre, yeah, for your support you. and participation. She's given us a lot of input, too. Really good input. Yes, amazing input. Thank you all. Okay. Um, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to just add a few resources that I think people might enjoy on Please. the website, on the on the WellMed Charitable Foundation podcast. I know that there are several um, really interesting podcasts that would be kind of supportive to the one that you've heard today. And that's, you know, uh, Life After Caregiving was one of them, uh, the Conversation Project, where they talk about, you know, planning for the end of life, you know, where caregivers can really, you know, feel like they're ready for it and they know, you know, exactly what their person wants. I also recommend mindfulness. A lot of the things that Lucy recommended, you know, about not judging yourself and forgiving yourself. Mindfulness has so much information about that. I recently took a free course. It was 40 days and it was like 10 minutes a day. And it was training on mind, it was kind of basic training on mindfulness, and it was very helpful. And that was by Tara Brock, T-A-R-A-B-R-A-C-H, and it was free. So I encourage you folks to, you know, do what you can do for yourself. You know, you're the only one who can do that. And with that, let me tell you about our new sessions coming up and about what you're going to get. You're going to get the resources with the post-session questionnaire. We hope you fill that out and let us know how we can improve um, or any suggestions you have for future topics. We appreciate that. And if you don't, if you're not registered, you won't get that, uh, unfortunately, but you can change that. Um, if you got the, the Zoom link or if you got the phone number from a friend, you can call our customer service representative at 866-390-6491, 866-390-6491 and get registered. And once you get registered, you will also get the monthly calendar, which is, you know, where everybody finds out how to register for these incredible sessions all by experts. 
and we've got coming up let's see i gotta put my glasses on let's next uh next tuesday august 8th we have a spanish pr presentation by dr Pradari, Pradario, the agitation in dementia it's all in spanish language for those of you who have friends who speak spanish on August 10th, that's Thursday, why does dementia cause hallucinations, delusions, and paranoia? And that's our dear Lucy is presenting that on August 14th, the other dementias with Dr. Samuel Brickman. And this is interesting because so many people think, you know, that it's always Alzheimer's or, you know, but there it's the statistics show different. And so it's not, it's Alzheimer's is the major one, but if you're between the age of 40 and 60, it's probably frontotemporal dementia. So it's those sorts of things that are interesting to find out. Um, on Tuesday, August 15th, um, I'm sorry, on Thursday, August 17th, dementia, stigma, and caregiving with Dr. Natalie Oliver. And then on the 22nd, I will be presenting, not as a neuroscientist, but um, as a social worker on anxiety and the new science of the brain. And then on the 24th, moving away from the idea of codependency with Dr. Jamie Heisman. And then on Tuesday, the 29th, what to know about the new treatment for Alzheimer's disease with Dr. Elliot Montgomery Slaughter. So as always, we've got a full packed month of experts and I just want to take the opportunity to thank these two experts for their research, their knowledge, their experience, what they bring forward to these sessions is amazing. I always learn from them. And I really appreciate them. And I appreciate what all of you caregivers do every single day. Thank you so much. You're the backbone of long-term care. And I appreciate WellMed Charitable Foundation because they have really built a community, a space, a, a knowledge base for caregivers in the United States and, some, and, and Canada. And I think we had one once from Mexico. Yes. Okay. So thank you all so much. And please remember that Lucy and Elliot are going to stay on, but I am going to stop the recording now. And so you can be anonymous on your phone call. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you so much.